Hi, my name's Alyssa. Thanks for watching today. Before we get started, we wanted to fill you in on our church. Here at Grace, we have a mission and a purpose. Our goal is to help people discover truth, decide on Jesus, demonstrate change, and deploy for others. If you're looking for a church, we would love for you to come be a part of what God is doing here at Grace. You can check us out on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. We would also like to invite you to one of our Sunday morning services. Check out ohiograce.com for a list of campuses and service times in your area. We have a great time gathering for music, hanging out, and learning about who God is and how that affects our lives. Thanks for watching, and we hope to see you here next week at Grace. Good morning. Good to see you. Appreciate you being here. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Um, we did, and uh, hope yours was as good as ours. Um, just a great time, and uh, God's been good to all of us, hasn't he? He's uh, provided so much for us, and especially if you know his son is your Lord and Savior, then you know the privilege and the honor of being able to walk with him through life and the assurance of heaven one day knowing that your sins are forgiven, knowing that uh, he has provided all that for you, and you have nothing to fear in this world because he walks with you. And that's good news. It's good stuff to be able to serve him. Again, hope your Thanksgiving was great. We're closing out rough crowd this morning. Kevin mentioned last week that Joseph had seen some tough times in his life, you know, all the deal with his brothers, and then the issue with Mrs. Potiphar, and then... Potiphar himself, and so he had jail and all this other stuff, prison accusations and all that stuff going on. Now, these people are some of the reasons why this is called a rough crowd. Maybe you've found yourself there before. You know, maybe we're not everybody always thinks you're the greatest, and sometimes they, they don't treat you the best. Sometimes we face our own rough crowd. Well, Joseph's life serves as an example to us of how to deal with those situations. If you remember, we ended last week after Joseph gave a test to his brothers to see if they had changed. And, and maybe surprisingly, Judah passed. He, he showed that he was trying to do things the right way and offering to stay as a slave in place of his brother Benjamin. And we pick it up today right after that in chapter 45, just after Judah's made that offer. And what happens next is one of several big moments in Joseph's life that we're going to see today. Those big moments, they're, they're all sort of emotion-packed. Uh, we've seen him, Joseph, cry before, and all of these moments are marked by Joseph crying. And, and he's, he's going to cry at each one. I don't think it's because he's, he's an emotional mess that just can't hold it together. I think it tells us, though, how tough the times have been for him over the 20 years since his brothers sold him. Think about it, 20 years since he'd seen his dad. He never had a chance to say goodbye. 20 years of separation, plus all the, 20 years of separation. We're getting ready to have a little bit of a separation in our own family. Uh, it's not Becky and I. It's, uh, <laughs> but uh, our daughter Carrie, who is married to Cameron, who is a, chaplain in the army, and uh, their kids, Riley, Hudson, and Case, Cameron has orders for Germany. Um, in two months, he's got to be there with the family, and they're going to be gone for three years. And I am not looking forward to this. You know, um, thankfully, we got it way better than Joseph had it, because our relationships are good, and we've got the internet, and we hope to visit and, and, and it's a way shorter time, three years compared to 20. You can imagine why Joseph's having such a struggle. Emotion-packed times. We look at the first big moment. 
And it comes up right there in chapter 45, verse 1. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried, have everyone go out from me. So, so there was no man with him whom Joseph made himself, when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard of it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? Brothers, brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, please come closer to me. And they came closer, and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And so this is a big moment. It would have been something to have been there at that moment to experience that. I think Judah has just offered himself in place of Benjamin, and Joseph is overcome. He can't hold it in. When we're told about him crying before, the two times before, both of those times he had been able to control himself by leaving the room. But this time, he can't hold it in. He gives the order, get everybody out of here. And while nobody else can see what's going on, a lot of people can hear it. He cried so loudly. Pharaoh's household heard it. Heard the English says here, our translation inserts the words of it. And that may be true. They may have heard of his crying, but it also may be true that they just heard it. It was so loud. It's possibly he's living right next door to Pharaoh as the prime minister of Egypt. But he sends everybody out and he tells his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? And they are blown away. So blown away that they can't even answer him. All these years later, Joseph Really, Joseph, how is that possible? But he's here, and they're trying to process it all. And probably immediately, they're also scared to death, right? <laughs> I mean, especially when Joseph says, hey, remember you, I'm the one you sold to slavery? Hey, come closer. <laughs> I'd be like, no, it's okay. I can hear you from where I'm at, you know. Don't need to, Joseph, come, it was, it was then that Joseph says, hey, I'm your brother, Joseph. Nobody except them and Joseph would have known that they had sold him. So there's no doubt. This is Joseph. They got to be thinking we are so dead. It could have easily been the case. But look at what Joseph says in verse 5. Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God, and he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hey, don't be grieved, don't be angry. And you see here the reason Joseph can let go of all that he's been through. Because Joseph isn't drowning in a victim mentality. He's not wallowing in self-pity. It's so tempting for us to fall into, isn't it? When we think someone or something has done us wrong and we want something like revenge or pity or support of some kind, when life's been hard and everybody's doing me wrong and I want something from you in order for me to feel better and we get some satisfaction out of that response for some reason. Instead, somehow Joseph came to realize that God had a plan in all of this. In fact, Joseph talks more about God and his plan than he talks about himself. And God's plan was to save lives, many lives, to save the lives of the brothers, to save a whole bunch of other people, to save the lives of the people of Egypt. In fact, I think when the Bible talks here about this remnant of people, that what we see is God working through time, working through the people of Israel, bringing it down. The whole, this, what we see here is part of the, God's plan to redeem men. He's always working. He was working then to work to bring to, to us today. This story impacts us because God kept those brothers going through Joseph. The plan was always in place. 
God had a plan to save lives. These guys are stunned. Their mouths are probably still hanging open. And then Joseph tells them to go tell their father that he's alive and he's ruling over Egypt. He invites them to come back. Hey, you guys come on back. And I got a place for you it's in the land of Goshen. Goshen was an area up in the, the um, northern, northeast Egypt, just east of the Nile Delta. It was a place that was fertile. It was a place that they could raise their flocks. And Joseph's like, you guys come on back. You can live in Goshen. And he, and he promises to provide for them there. It's a place that in chapter 47 was called the best part of the land of Egypt. He's giving them something good. And then Joseph cries again. This time as he's kissing his brothers as they prepare to leave. Sometime in all this, Pharaoh hears about the brothers being there and he also invites them all to come back and live in Egypt. And he piles them down with supplies, food and clothing. And Joseph added in 20 donkeys loaded with grain and bread for his father and he sends them off. He sends them off with, in verse, what, in verse 24 is, I think, a, a funny comment. He says, hey, tells his brothers, don't quarrel on the journey. <laughs> hey, guys, no fighting. We just had, you know, these 11 brothers were on this journey. We just had 11 grandkids at our house for a couple of days. We probably said that numerous times, no fighting. It sounds like very much like a family, and Joseph certainly knew his brothers. They had a tendency to argue a lot. So no fighting, guys, as you go. And after all, they were under a lot of pressure, right? I mean, they had to answer Joseph. But can you imagine the conversation they have to have with their dad? Hmm. Hey, Dad, um, just wanted you to, to let you know, uh, remember when we told you uh, that Joseph had been killed by some wild beasts? Well, that, that you, may, you may find this funny, but... It actually turns out, Dad, that Joseph's alive. And not only that, but he's, he's, he's ruling over Egypt. He's actually ruling Egypt. And you know what? We're not told how Jacob responded to them. But we are told that he was pumped and excited to learn that Joseph was alive. And what happens next is the whole family packs up they, and they head for Egypt. In verse 29 of chapter 46 Joseph also packs up and goes to meet them. He said, Joseph prepared his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father Israel. Another big moment in his life. He's going to see his dad after these 20 years. So as soon as he appeared before him, he fell on his neck and wept on his neck for a long time. Joseph's crying again. Finally gets to see his dad. 20 years. He's going to have 17 years now with Jacob before Jacob passes away. But they get to settle in there. They settle into their new home. Some of the brothers and Jacob are actually called to meet with Pharaoh. We're told five brothers. We don't know which five and we don't know how they were chosen. But five brothers and Jacob go to meet with Pharaoh. And, and as they're going, Joseph tells them, hey guys, when you, when you meet with Pharaoh and he asks you what you do, um, just go ahead and tell him that you're shepherds. See, sh shepherds were looked down on in Egypt. Uh, but Joseph knows it's way, you, you do not lie to Pharaoh, okay? It doesn't go good for you if you do. So tell him the truth. Tell him you're shepherds. And they do that. They tell the truth and it works out. Pharaoh gives them the best of the land. So it's all good at this point. They're together. They've got everything they need and more. Joseph is guiding the people of Egypt through the famine, and when the people ran out of money, they would sell their land to Pharaoh. Joseph provided that opportunity for them. They would sell that land, and then he would provide them with food. Everything's working out. Everything's good. Until one day, Joseph got word that his father was sick. And, and he goes to see his dad, and he takes his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, and it's there that Jacob declares Ephraim and Manasseh to be his sons legally. They're going to stay with Joseph, 
but they're his legal. It's a, it's a way to legitimize them as the fathers of, of, of tribes. And so they get to be the heads of two tribes of Israel. The other 51 sons that he has, they're going to inherit from their fathers, but these two are going to be heads of tribes themselves. We're not going to spend much time there, but in chapter 49, Jacob goes on to prophesy on each of his sons. For some of them, it was good news. For others, not so much. Like Reuben. Reuben, who was the firstborn, and there would have been normally certain privileges that went with that. But there's a problem with Reuben, right? I mean, because he slept with his stepmother. So Jacob tells him, hey, you're not going to have preeminence even if you are firstborn. You notice, and historically, that's what occurs. The Reubenites are integrated into the tribe of Gad later on. And then there's Simeon and Levi. They have a curse pronounced on them for their massacre of the men of Shechem. Not good. And on the other hand, you've got Judah, who's pronounced as the kingly line. We're told in verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. That's great news, not only for Judah, but for us as well. It's important because this is the line from which Jesus will come. You know, he's the line of the tribe of Judah, right? So this is important as we start getting closer to Christmas. This is all part of that bigger plan of God to redeem men. It's all over this story. And then before he dies, Jacob also tells them to bury him in the cave at Machpelah, the same place, the same cave that Abraham and Sarah were buried in, and Isaac and Rebekah. He has them commit to that. And then we're told he dies. Another big moment for Joseph, and he weeps again. In chapter 50, verse 1, it says, Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Now, 40 days were required for it, but such is the period required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept for him 70 days. So Joseph's life of good things and tough things continues. And now he's broken. He falls on Jacob's face, weeping, and kissed him. And as close as they had been, this is devastating for Joseph. He commands his father to be embalmed. Egyptian embalming was primarily a religious ritual. One of the first things they did was they cut a, a long slit down the side of the abdomen to remove some of the organs. The person who did that was called the one who slits. The one who slits. That's his only function in the whole process. The one who slits. You know, you imagine people asking, what do you do? I'm the one who slits. Probably doesn't have a whole lot of friends. <laughs> We're told the Egyptians wept for Jacob for 70 days. That's pretty amazing. That's a sign of great respect. You know, they, were, they viewed the pharaohs as gods. They worshiped, they, and, and they, they mourned the pharaohs when they died for 72 days. So just two days shy of what they mourned for, for the pharaohs. And then this long funeral procession started up. You ever been in a long funeral procession? <laughs> Probably not anything like this one, though would have taken 10 to 12 days to travel up there. Can you imagine that? And, and it's a long time and it's a long line. Because we're told Joseph was there and all his brothers were there and all the, the servants of Pharaoh went and the elders of Pharaoh and of the land of Egypt. So you got all these high-ranking members of Pharaoh's bureaucracy. They all went up. They also had a military escort of chariots and horsemen. It's described as a very great company. It's huge. Even the Canaanites recognized the mourning as being way beyond the norm. This is a big deal. And so they go up. They spend the 10 to 12 days. They get up there. They, they get Jacob buried. And then they turn and start heading back. 
heading back to Egypt, just like Joseph had promised Pharaoh, which brings up the final big moment in chapter 50 and verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong which we did to him? So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father charged before he died saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, please forgive, I beg you, the transgressions of your brothers and their sin for they did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. He's crying again, this huge moment is they make this request. They got all nervous. What if dad was the reason Joseph didn't pay us back? And what if now that he's gone, Joseph decides to get us? Oh, and we know when this whole thing started, they hated Joseph. Now they're thinking Joseph hates them. And so Joseph cries. I mean, what they're thinking sort of makes logical sense. It's the way a lot of people would, would react if they'd been treated like Joseph had been treated. They'd want to get even. So the brothers try to come at it from a couple different angles. First, they didn't come directly. Instead, they sent a messenger to Joseph. Hey, Hey, uh, Joseph, remember what dad said? He said, forgive and forget, Joseph, so please do that. Now, we've got no way of knowing whether Jacob actually said that or not. And knowing these guys, there's a pretty good possibility they're just making that up. You know, they're just trying to work the system a little bit here. Joseph, hey, dad said before he died, he told us to tell you, forgive, the, forgive the, these guys what they did to you, so please do that. And then they go sort of the spiritual route. They call themselves the servants of the God of your father. Joseph, just remember, when you're, if you're thinking about killing us, we're good with God. And... And we're not, not just any God, Joseph, but we're servants of the God of your father, our, our father too, and we're, we're, all, we're all good, so we're hoping that you're good with us. Think about that, Joseph. Well, Joseph, here's the message. He cried. And now there's this one final bridge to cross with his brothers. The next thing the brothers did was they, they came personally, maybe thinking they had softened the landing some by the message they sent. And they announced themselves as Joseph's servants. Hey, Joe, whatever you want, brother, we're there for you. But Joseph's response, it's so good. It's so good that people still use it when they look at their own life circumstances, especially when, when someone has done them wrong. So in verse 19 we read, but Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for I, am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. I mean, think about that. These guys had thought about killing him. They'd sold him into slavery. They lied about to him. And what they did had an impact on him for the rest of his life. From just a human standpoint, I don't, I don't mean to belabor this, but think from just a human standpoint, it would be understandable if Joseph wanted to make them pay. But instead, Joseph gives this great example of forgiveness. And the very first thing he says to them is, hey, don't, don't be afraid. He doesn't give them any reason not to be afraid. He just set, sets the direction of what he's going to say. Guys, you don't, you don't need to be afraid. Now let me tell you why. As bad as he'd been treated by them, he responds this way. And if you're having a hard time forgiving someone for something in your life, you might want to take a look at what Joseph does here. Because probably it's not as bad as what they had done to Joseph. 
First of all, he asked the question, am I in God's place? Am I in God's place? See, the step of getting things right and justice, Joseph correctly sees that as belonging to God. That's his. He's, and Joseph's not going to cross that line. He's willing to be God's servant, but he won't try to be God's substitute. So because of that, because he's not God, he says, you guys, you don't need to fear me. I'm not going to do this. I'm not, I'm not going after justice here. I'm forgiving you. You don't need to be afraid of me. Everything else is in God's hands. Second thing, God meant it for good. You guys, you meant it for evil. There's no getting around that. You know, it's, it's, and it's good to not try to excuse wrong or deny wrong or whitewash it. Joseph puts it right out there. You meant it for evil. There's no doubt. But God meant it for good. And notice that Joseph's not saying he meant it for good for me. Joseph. No, he's, God meant it for good, and it's a lot bigger than one guy. He meant it for good in order to preserve many people alive. Many people. He did it to preserve many people alive. Which again, impacted all of Egypt then, but that line of redemption goes down through time to you and to me. God's plan at work. He gives them another reason not to fear. I'm going to provide for you and your families. Not only am I not going to do you harm, but I'm going to do good to you by providing for you and your kids. I'll take care of you. Don't be afraid. So Joseph's like, you don't have to be afraid because, one, I'm not God. Two, God meant it for good. And three, because I'm going to take care of you guys. Don't be afraid. You talk about a complete example of forgiveness. And what a great way to be rem remembered as the last big act of your life. The book of Genesis then closes out with the end of Joseph's life. Verse 22 says, Now Joseph stayed in Egypt, he and his father's household, and Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw the third generation of Ephraim's sons, also, the sons of Maker, the sons of Manasseh, were born, the son of Manasseh, were born on Joseph's knees. Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised on oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones up from here. So Joseph died at the age of 110 years. And he was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. 110 years. He lived the first 17 in Canaan. The last 93 years in Egypt. He lived, lived to see some of his great-grandchildren. Even adopted some. That's what the phrase born on J Joseph's knees refers to. It means he adopted the sons of Meeker. Joseph gives his last recorded words to his brothers. I'm going to die, but God is going to take care of you and bring you up out of this land. And he made his brothers swear that they would take his bones out of Egypt when they left. It's interesting, back in the 60s, archaeologists started digging around an area of the eastern Nile Delta at a site called Tel Eldaba. What they found there was evidence of a, an Asiatic community with a lot of enclosures for animals. It starts to sound a little familiar, right? It's in the right location. They had a lot of animals. This is a settlement that's not exactly uh, Egyptian. They got... The, and, and, they, and they, what, they, what they found there as well was a palace, a palace that had both Egyptian and Semitic styles to it, a big palace that some scholars believe was actually Joseph's retirement home, that after serving Pharaoh for many years, he goes to live with his family there in Goshen, 
big palace, two areas up front that they believe his sons would have lived, area in the back that's bigger for Joseph and his Egyptian wife. Attached to that palace was a large garden area. In that garden area were 12 tombs. Sounds even more familiar, doesn't it? 12 tombs, one of them was uh, sort of unique in that it had the shape of a pyramid. It was bigger and shaped like a pyramid. It's a picture of, of what you got there. 12 tombs, one pyramid that's unique. In those 12, in the 11 periods, a small, 11 tombs, the smaller tombs, they found the bodies that were still remaining there. In the 12th tomb, no body. We'll talk about that in just a minute. What they did find was the remains of a statue that had been there. That statue had been busted up, but they were able to piece back that statue, and it looks something like this. And when you look at that statue, what you start realizing is, is a number of things. First of all, he's got this crop that he's holding in his hand that was a sign of power in Egypt. So this is obviously someone who's got a lot of authority. On that crop, though, is also the symbol, the uh, Egyptian hieroglyphic for a foreigner. So he's got a lot of power in Egypt, but he's not Egyptian. He's also got that bowl cut of a haircut. That was Semitic. He's got a, hold on, multicolored goat. Is that weird? Now we know the, you know, the original multicolored coat was dipped in blood, right? Covered in blood and given to Jacob and said, hey, this is, Joseph's dead. Which makes me think, either Joseph told that story a lot to people about the multicolored coat, or maybe he had another one made when he's there, got all that power and money in Egypt, just as, as a remembering home or something. But there's no body there. Why is that? Because Joseph told him, take me out of here. When you guys go back to Canaan, take me out with you. And in Exodus 13, 19, Moses, we're told, took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones from here with you. Think about it. Hundreds of years passed between Joseph's death and the Exodus. Hundreds of years. And somehow, they knew where Joseph's body was. To take it, how was that? Maybe it was because he was in some unique pyramid-shaped tomb behind the palace where he used to live. And people question whether or not the people of Israel ever in Egypt. Crazy, huh? Joseph's life comes to an end. But his example lives on. The example that he left for us in how to deal with a rough crowd. Of not hanging on to self-pity or victim mentality. Instead, being willing to forgive totally. Maybe the reason we hold on to our hurts instead of forgiving someone is because we're not convinced, like Joseph was, that God has a plan. And when we hold on to our hurts, it's really an indication that we don't have a big enough view of God and his goodness. Because when we know that God means to use whatever is happening for good, and then we can let it go, can't we? Like Joseph did. Facing your own rough crowd, the answer's clear. Trust God's goodness. Don't take on a victim mentality and forgive. And as we start the push towards Christmas, maybe there's some people in your life that need to be forgiven. 
great time of year to get that taken care of, isn't it? Don't put it off. Show Christ to the rough crowd around you. I think that's what Joseph would want. And I think that's what the God of heaven who worked throughout this whole story to preserve a line so that we could be redeemed one one as well this Christmas. Forgive those who've done you wrong and move on for the sake of the kingdom. Represent Christ well in this world and let him draw them to himself. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, God, for your incredible love for us, undeserving unworthy so grateful God that you would work through time and history to reach out to us God thank you for uh, recording the life of Joseph for us so that we could learn we could learn of your goodness and your greatness and also learn of the example of Joseph. God, that we would forgive and we would move on and we would celebrate your plan in this world to save people. God, I pray that we'd walk out of here today with that commitment and a renewed commitment to represent you in this world in such a way that people would come to know you. We love you. We thank you for loving us. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Thanks for watching, and we hope to see you here next week at Grace.